Hi everyone, my name is Priyash and I'm currently a teaching fellow at QuesMed. Today I'm going to talk about the United Kingdom Medical Licensing Assessment, or UKMLA, an exam that you have to take in order to practice medicine in the UK. At QuesMed, we have worked hard to create a dedicated all-in-one platform with over 12,000 AKT questions and 250 OSCE CPSA style stations based on the themes that you will encounter in your exam. To start with, what is the UK MLA? The UK MLA is a standardised medical licensing exam in the United Kingdom. It's designed to assess the knowledge and skills of medical graduates to ensure that they meet the required standards for safe and effective practice as doctors. The UK MLA is taken by all medical graduates who wish to practice medicine in the UK, regardless of whether they trained in the UK or abroad. This includes international medical graduates, or IMGs, and those who are completing their medical degrees in the UK. For medical students in the UK, you will sit the UK MLA exam around the time that you have your finals exams. For IMGs, it will eventually replace the PLAB and you can consider the terms interchangeable for the purposes of this video, especially when we get to talking about the format of the exam. So the UK MLA consists of two main components, the Applied Knowledge Test, AKT, and the Clinical and Professional Skills Assessment, CPSA. These are very similar to the PLAB1 and PLAB2 respectively, which are currently undertaken for international medical graduates. The AKT is a written exam that assesses your knowledge of medical science, clinical reasoning, and professional practice. For UK medical students, this will be two 100 SBA question exams, taken on a computer with each exam around two hours long. This would be the equivalent of the PLAB1 exam, and you will see that the content maps reflect that. The two papers will examine clinical topics in the following format. On the other hand, the CPSA evaluates your clinical and professional skills through a series of practical assessments. This part of the exam can take place at various clinical sites and is designed to reflect real life scenarios. In most UK medical schools, this is referred to as an OSCE or PLAB2 for IMGs. The GMC have produced content maps for each specialty that will be examined in the UK MLA, consisting of core presentations and conditions for each. Although a long document, please don't be alarmed. In the UK, this is very much aligned with your medical school curricula, and if you've trained abroad, this is likely to be the case too. Here's an example of what you might find in the content map. At QuesMed, our textbook is aligned to the UK MLA, covering exactly what you need to know for the exam. In terms of costs, for UK medical students, the cost is covered in your tuition fees. For IMGs, the cost of taking the UK MLA may vary, so it's important to check the GMC website for the most up-to-date information. If you don't pass the UK MLA on your first attempt, you can resit the exam. However, there may be limitations on the number of resits allowed and you'll need to meet certain eligibility criteria. Now that we've been through the content and structure of the exam, I thought it would be helpful to go through how we at QuesMed would advise you to answer the kinds of questions that will come up in your AKT exam. And we have a few examples to help show that. When approaching SBA questions, let's first start with the cover-uncover approach. With this method, you should cover the answers first, and this will allow you to break things down a bit more in the question. Take a second to pause and read the question. We have deliberately covered the answers. Here you can see that you have someone with an ejection systolic murmur, loudest on expiration at the left intercostal space, which also radiates to the carotid arteries. And without even looking at the answer, you can probably tell that it's most likely aortic stenosis. Then when you uncover and you find that AS is one of the options, you can select it with confidence knowing that you're probably right. Let's look at a harder question. Pause the screen and have a read. So this is a question that asks a lot. And the point here is that if you look at the answers first, you may freak out because there's quite a bit of text. So what I suggest is that you cover the answers again. Read through the question. This person has weight loss, a cough, bloody sputum, and he's a smoker. Could it be lung cancer? They're also feverish, sweating, more thirsty than usual, finding it difficult to pass stool, and they're confused. Could it be lung cancer with something else, like a complication of lung cancer? So in this scenario, the latter group of symptoms is suggesting hypercalcemia. The patient is passing more urine, they're more constipated and confused, and the clubbing goes hand in hand, pun intended, with lung cancer. The answer here is hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, which is associated with squamous cell lung cancer. 
This is a hard question, so don't worry about it if you didn't get it, but it's important to recognise that if you break things down, you may first come to the conclusion that this is probably lung cancer, and it could be that it's something related to something else. You could also figure out that it's related to hypercalcemia. And then if you have all the information, you'll know that B is the answer. Here you require a lot of steps to get the diagnosis, but if you break it down and cover the answers first, you can take a bit more time to think about it without being stressed out by lots of wordy and different answers. Emergencies are very important, and the emergency curriculum is important for examiners to assess your practice, so that if on day one an emergency happens, you escalate accordingly. There's lots of guidelines that are very helpful, such as the ALS guidelines, but also in the back of the Oxford Handbook. I've always found this very useful, and as a junior doctor, I used to look into it in my first couple months as an F1 doctor. It's important to understand what's in the question, and the clues that will help you answer it correctly. If you're in an outpatient or GP clinic, that's different from the emergency department. For example, if you're in the clinic, the question will test your knowledge of long-term treatments, when you need to escalate, and when you need to do things a bit more urgent. Whereas in the emergency department, it will focus on your A to E approach and making sure that the important complications are dealt with early. The other aspect of demographics is knowing who the patient is. So if it's a 70 year old, you will have a different differential diagnosis to a 20 year old. So make sure that when you're looking at the presenting complaint, you consider your differentials first and then which features are those that help make the diagnosis. Because lots of questions will ask you to weigh between different things, some of which could be completely unrelated. Investigations form quite a big chunk of most exams, and you'll often be asked to differentiate between definitive investigations to confirm the diagnosis, or the next best or initial investigation. For example, a tissue biopsy in celiac disease is the best or gold standard investigation. However, if you are in primary care, the initial investigation you may do is a panel of bloods including anti-TTG antibodies. Sometimes it's helpful to use guidelines for this, however sometimes you'll have to use your clinical judgement. The other way to approach these questions is thinking what will harm the patient most severely in the first instance. What you're doing here is trying to make sure that you can tell the examiner that you know what's safe and that you know what you need to rule out early in terms of complications and that you're safe to manage patients on your own and with help and escalating appropriately. A framework mnemonic that I use for investigations is BBBII. Not the catchiest, but it helps me remember that the first thing to do is to check the background so the history and examination, then bedside tests like ECG or blood glucose, and then you have your blood tests, imaging, and invasive investigations. The point is, we're usually opting for the least invasive stuff early on which causes the least amount of harm, and then the more invasive stuff later on. Similarly with management, after taking into account urgency, you are always trying to make sure to do the conservative stuff first, and then consider the medical options, and then the surgical. And that's how we think about management options in clinical practice too. For example, in emergencies again, it's A to E first and then everything else. As for the best practices for answering SBAs, there's a lot to say about exam technique. And the key is to make sure that you're prepared so that on the day you have come through this many, many, many times so that you're not stressed. You probably will still be stressed in any case, but hopefully this will give you a bit more about how you can try to minimize that on the day. You have about a minute or so to answer each question and you have to balance between trying to answer questions quickly but also reading them properly and considering your options appropriately. What you should be doing early on in your revision is taking your time with questions, trying to think through the answers thoroughly, and then closer to the exam you should be going through timed quizzes to simulate the exam environment. Balancing between time management and taking in the question will come with practice, and if you're not getting it early on that's fine, it will come after a few weeks or months of work. So make sure that you have enough time to make that transition from very slow reading to slightly faster and trying to work within exam conditions. For medical exams, it's quite useful to have some rules of thumb in your mind about different demographics because it allows you to raise your index of suspicion for certain diseases. So if the question mentions a 22 year old athlete collapsing, the first thing you are thinking about or hopefully will be thinking about is, is this hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Because it's something that you may have come across before. It's fine to have that initial thought in your head, but you need to make sure that you're also thinking about the rest of the question and whether or not it supports or doesn't support your diagnosis. So that's everything that I wanted to cover on the UK MLA exam and how to approach answering the questions you'll be encountering in the AKT part of it. Thank you for listening, and if you have any further questions, our email is in the description. 
With over 12,000 AKT questions and 250 CPSA stations, QuezMed is the single best resource for preparing for the UK MLA and your medical school finals. Our SBAs and CPSA stations cover all of the core presentations and conditions in the content map. Look out for lots more content from us, which will help you with your UK MLA preparation and follow our socials for updates. We wish you the very best of luck here at QuezMed.